So, um, basic little drawing there that I did with not enough time. The farm, the farm has a me- we have a mental model about how, fa- how our farms work. You know, depending on how long we've been on the farm, it's finely tuned and for some it's, um, it's on the go. But this mental model basically says, you know, it, it rains then, it gets cold then, it gets warm then, we wean then, we, uh, we expect to see this then and we expect to see that as well. And that's kind of how we inherit our mental picture of how things go from mum or dad or grandfather or the person that we bought the farm from. A little bit like what Dave, um, or to follow on from what Dave put up, um, that mental model is pretty difficult to sustain in most actual situations. That's actually just some data. I've done this time and time and time and time again. We go and get the farm's rainfall, take it, just take it back as far as we can and say, righto, how's that model looking? And it's generally going to be a Picasso. It's generally going to be um, ugly. We don't, really, we don't relate to that. But that's pretty much how it tends to be. Um, I've, I've looked at that data, uh, and that's the joy of my life. I actually get to, to, I get, I get to learn from this stuff day in, day out. And from Texas all the way through to wherever we are right now, it's, it, it doesn't matter if it's Ebor or anywhere else, that kind of situation is accruing, which means, as Dave said, calendar year stuff is pretty well, you know, it's not, it's not very useful. So we've got limited time on Earth, let's be useful. Again, following on from what Dave said, um, I almost packed my lunch and went when Dave um, was talking about the rainfall because he set the scene for me beautifully here. And this is actually... So Dave did a particular farm and I thought, bugger it, smoke, I went, I'll go and I'll, I'll double you. So I, <laughs> I've, gone, I've gone and got every farm's um, data points for rainfall that sits in Myra at the moment in Australia and, and just done an aggregation of that and said, right, how is the, the trend of roll, rolling rainfall going through that period of time, which is, um, I don't know, 2006 through to current, and, and take all of those individual data points and say, we know that farm has an average of this, their actual was that, for that point in time. And you look at that and you say, right, um, it isn't chaos. It isn't actually random. Again, like David said, there's... There's a trend of being wetter. There's a trend of being drier. And every now and then, we cross over on the way through. The good old days. So, if you think grazing is hard, uh, it is. It's really bloody hard. If you were, an, if you were dropped in here as an alien, right, and someone said to you, look, um, the, the stuff that, that you need to grow the inventory that you're going to run your production from, which may or may not be a few million bucks worth of stuff, is going to come from that chart, you'd say, right. <laughs> right. Okay. So it's been a bit of a bronco ride. And this is why. And funnily enough, if you go to Texas or you go through this, the, 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 um, the southern, at least, of, end of, of uh, the US and you come around the globe all the way to ourselves here, this little puppy and its mate keeps popping up. So there's nothing unpredictable about the fact that it's going to happen. The only thing that's not really quite predictable is how severe it's going to be and, and how long it's going to last. But it's going to happen. And obviously it needs updating. There's another little red bar to go on the right-hand side there. So, you know, there's no conflict there. We kind of all know that. We kind of all get that. We've all heard stories about it. But even the young ones in the room have seen it, right? We've all been there. And so to, to move on with the story, the outcome of that is predictable in different ways for different people. I've put those two slides up um, because it's actually the same paddock. And it's an, ex- it, it's an exaggerated version of this thing where we are either understocked or overstocked in the same paddock at a point in time. You know, we're doing it pretty tough and pretty stressed on the right. We never ever want to be there again. We're looking good on the left, but we're actually leaving money on the table. So, if we step back and, and we get into the, you know, we're talking about drought, drought, droughts. It's just, again, a bit of reference. We go from a point being cool, great, beer at the pub, everything's okay, 
And then we start to hear the chatter. Okay, it's starting to dry off. The season didn't quite turn up on time. It doesn't matter if we're in Biloela, Wagga Wagga or um, Launceston. The season's late or the season's short or the season's a little bit off the money. It's drying off. We're cool. And then you get this subtle change in the conversation while there's a bunch of data changing and there's a whole bunch of models going on and there's a whole bunch of actual numbers saying, you know what, this happened four weeks ago. But in the, in the conversation, we've started hoping. Right? We've, uh, we've been there. I'm, I'm guessing you've been there. And what happens then is that fundamentally you're eating future grass. That's the problem. And then we go, shit, we're stuck. We've gone past that tipping point and we're feeding, feeding animals in a falling market. We've probably all been there in one way or another. And it's not okay. We've all been through it. So, so what's the message out of that? Well, let's step back and have a think about it. Um, timing is pretty critical. I pulled up, I found that slide on the left actually, um, the last time I talked about this, that was in the Daily Telly. Um, and then yesterday, a few hundred cattle uh, going downhill in the Pilbara and then there's all this other stuff going on. So it's, it's been quite a long drought this last six months, a long way from over. But the point is when it's on the news, it's way too late. The timing is, timing is everything. So if we stopped and we thought about this, because we are in this thing, you know, we're the frog in the boiling water at times and, and I think we all need a good slap at times. I know my wife says that, you need a good slap. Right? And, and the cockies just need a good slap. If drought was a bushfire, would you do the same sort of things that you do? You've got a, a three to six month build up, it might be a bit longer. You know, we're going through the cycle of drying off, um, low rainfall, big, big build up in fuel from the last time it got wet, which was the last La Nina. Then it gets some hot weather and we're going okay, but the thing's going up and the Bureau's starting to talk about it, and it's on the news, you know, fires are around like we've seen today. Um, and then in one day it just goes to catastrophic. You're not at the pub saying, yeah, nah, look, I'm going to wait for the wind to change. It's catastrophic. You're going to do something, right? You're going to stay, you're going to go, you're going to, you're going to do something, you're going to make a call. And in grazing, I reckon we're not terribly good at making a call. And there's all sorts of reasons for it and, and it's been touched on and will continue to be touched on, but that's our job. So, I'll be as bold as to say that drought is not the problem. It's certainly a problem and it certainly sucks and it's certainly no fun. And, you know, it's a bit unfortunate that we get confronted with it as regularly as we seem to be doing, but uh, I'll propose that it's not the problem. So, if I say that, then I've got to come up with something clever to counter that. So, what is the, what is the problem? And, and I think... If I think about all the number of times that I've, I've taken out a rifle and shot my left foot off, i.e. made a bad call, it's because I didn't know what the problem was. It's a bit wordy because I am, and I lack the time to really refine it, but the problem, I think, and I, I look forward to being corrected on this and challenged on this, and again, um, the funny one has kind of brought this up ahead of me, but we, we... You know, it's a big collective we here, isn't it? We lack the confidence and the impetus. So it's not just the confidence, but it's the actual spur to action, the impetus, to make the decisions that we should, which means a lot, right? I mean, there's a bunch of stuff just in that. At the time when doing so would benefit us the most. So we, we end up tending to make the calls eventually because you can't not make the call. You're going to make the call. But we tend to make the call and the data suggests... Again, you know, we have this fortunate existence where I'm looking at data all the time and this is how Meyer evolved that we'll get to. The, win, the, the margin is in the timing of making the call. I guess that's been the message so far today, so I won't, I won't labour it, but pretty, pretty essential, critical component to where we're going, actually knowing what the problem is. So I thought I'd just throw this in um, to tickle my own fancy, but uh, also to confront you with some numbers which you would not otherwise see and which will hopefully motivate you to take this more seriously than you already are because you're here, but which is, it's like this little black box for a paddock. It's, to me, it was a car crash. I saw this slow motion car crash 
in a paddock. And we all have relationships to animals and paddocks and people and, and stock and so on. This is just one quick look at a paddock through the eye of a drought. And, and a fairly limited one at that, but just simply to tell a little bit of a story about how this kind of works. Because we all have a farm with a bunch of paddocks. Um, or we work on farms that have a bunch of paddocks. On every farm you have the place where you take the visitors. <laughs> so that's the year, and I should say, that's yield over the last 12 months at the same point in time for each paddock. Very few farms are straight across the board. The dairies I've worked on all the way through to the extensive um, western country. It still has this, a variation of this. Where you take the visitors, that's where you have the picnics by the river. And that's where nobody ever sees. Okay, so that's being, that being agreed, I think, so far. <coughs> what happens when we go into this bloody El Nino? Probably, you know, about late last spring. We're running out of feed. Which part of that little gradient do we hit harder? Do we do it equally? Do we do it differently? What's your answer? It's a little bit obvious, yeah. I mean, we don't talk about it, we don't want to, but the, we actually end up feeding out the stuff that we've got when we're running out. Right? And we hit it, we hit it hard because we're in hope. So if we're in hope, we're still hitting that thing until it doesn't want to talk to us. So let's have a look at that as an example. And I just happen to have a relationship to this paddock. And, and truth be told, um, in another life, I, I look at nutrition and, um, and production. And uh, I haven't told Alistair yet, this, but this is actually one of your paddocks, Alistair. So <laughs> this, this, is, this is a paddock that tweaked my interest because I couldn't understand why it wasn't performing after we started to spend more money on it than we had on other paddocks with inputs and <coughs> subdivision and love. So... I deconstructed what happened to this paddock to try and understand it. And it just happens to give me some charts to work with. So here we have a blue line, which is the long-term average rainfall. Here we have a, an up and down line, which is the rolling rainfall for that paddock. Not for the property, but for that paddock through those many months down the bottom there. And on the, the green chart, okay, so, so, it's, so it's average, Oh shit, it's getting very dry. That was actually a pretty dry time, about 400 and something mils of rainfall rolling versus 670 of um, average. And then it got wetter and then it got drier and then it got to where we are now. That's fine. We've heard about that. We've talked about that. Let's just think about the paddock, not the farm, but the paddock. We have things that, we have a lawnmower that goes into that paddock pretty, pretty uh, periodically or it gets put in there and stays in there. And that's a bunch of cows in this case. And, you know, we know how long the cows are in there. We know how much they eat. So we know what the harvested mower has pulled out of this paddock per month. So um, the numbers probably don't matter. The numbers don't matter. So we're pulling out about the same amount per month from this paddock. We're cruising along. We've got some cows, we're doing this, we're doing that. Um, management will basically say, yep, I'm just going to keep on mowing the grass as I feel works. Um, and then maybe something happened and we, we missed a month, so we made it up for the next month. Not uncommon. Kind of feels intuitively right. And then you'll see that at that time, it got progressively drier. It actually went into drought. That was the drought before the last drought. And you'll notice then that um, the practice of just putting them back in stopped. This was pre-tools and pre all the stuff you've been hearing about today, right? Um, the feed wasn't there. And, well, it makes sense because it got drier. But then, um, you know, we, we, we do what we have to do in breeding jobs compared to trading jobs at times, and we just we eke out the, the moisture from the sponge the best we possibly can. We keep harvesting some grass because that paddock's, you know, it's got a bit to give, so let's take it. And then sooner or later, this girl just says, you know what, stuff you, I've had it, I'm tired. No more babies, no more nothing, right? You, I'm, I'm, I'm barren, there's, there's no feed. And the thing I'd ask you to look at, though, is look at what happened to the season after that. The season got better. We actually went back to long-term average rainfall, but the damage had been done. This is the number that I'll put up in, in a minute that I want you to take think of. 
I've done it, I've hidden from that, I haven't wanted to talk about it, but I know that I've hurt paddocks. I know that I've hurt country, and I've always thought, well, I'm just going to rest that sucker. I'm just going to... I'm just going to love it later. I'm going to put some stuff into it. I'm going to put some love into it and everything's going to be okay, which is what we all tend to do. Um, and, I, and basically, if you, just, if you sum up all the grass that's come off that particular paddock, over that period of time, it's, it's been on a hiding to nothing, okay? Even though the seasons have improved since then and then dropped away. So this is just my way of representing that. Bear with me if you're not a visual person. The green line there is what actually was harvested from the paddock each time we did a harvest, each time we mowed it, put the cows in, did what we did. And it's a cumulative chart of the, of the successive grazes per month and saying, right, let's just, it makes sense. It's just this progressive increase. We've taken a bit, we've taken a bit, we've taken a bit. It's not relative to anything else. It's just taken a bit. And if we had have listened to the numbers and said, look, our... Carrying capacity isn't actually, this isn't, that, our stocking rate, which is the um, actual green line, and our carrying capacity based on what this paddock had told us, whispered in our ears, what it could demonstrably um, give us to harvest per unit of rainfall. Um, if we had have listened to that, look at the numbers and said, okay, it's not there to take. I'm not going to eat future feed. And we mapped that through because it got dry through that period of time. If we'd have taken that through, when it actually did get wetter, and if that paddock could say this is all hypothetical bullshit, and it kind of is, but, it, but, it, but it's actually modelled on the fact that that paddock has told us what it can do based on units of rainfall. Okay? So those units of rainfall came, and yet the actual fell away. But what that paddock had shown us it could do based on that same amount of rainfall in the past tells us that even though it was wetter, the gap between that line and that line is feed that we never saw. Okay, on just one paddock that we pushed a little bit harder than our gut instinct said we should, but you know what, we did it because we had to. So taking that feed there, which wasn't a lot of feed, but it was, it was what we had to do in our mind. Um, you know, argue with me about the numbers if you like, but it was, it was 1,270 kilos of grass, dry matter. Put a value on that, what replacement cost in a bit of hay. You're talking 120 bucks a hectare. It's a bit of money, right? The frightening thing is, if you, if you extrapolate that across all the best country, on all the farms that have just made those little calls, that's a number that no one ever sees. And it's, it's an awakener. It's, uh, it really it pushed me. It, it made me think, right, we have got to do a better job here because we're not seeing this. And I can assure you, the guy that makes the decisions on that farm, uh, he, he, he's gutted by that. You know, he, he doesn't want to be... That's not him. So, because every paddock's like he's, he's, he's a child. So, so um, it's a salient point. Makes you think, right? It's all, all of that, that hidden cost that we actually don't really take on board. Okay, so, so we're off the pace, all right? Um, there's no finger pointing. We're all off the pace. I'm off the pace. You're off the pace. We're all off the pace, but to different extents. Okay, there are there are definitely people that are having a good crack at this. And the thing I think, if I was just going to boil it down, right? Why are we off the pace? It's a fair question. I've put up a proposition that we're off the pace. So why are we off the pace? Well, I think again, it's about context and reference points and knowing which room we're in. Basically. We have an instinct. We carry stuff around in our head. Some of us are better than others. How many numbers can you carry around in your head in terms of where we're at? Sit down with the wife, sit down with the husband, sit down with the whole team. Where are we at? And you'll get 10 different opinions about where we're at at a point in time. Bugger that. You need to know how things are actually. That's good. That's good. But where are we relative to that? How should they be for the season that we've had, for the paddocks that we've, we've learned from, for the groups of paddocks that we've learned from, and from the farm? And then, right, how, how, it should, how, how it is, how it should be, and then blow me down, the best in the business is saying, how will it be? Right, that's the planning bit. How will it be? The, the current assumptions I'm making um, will scare the bejesus out of me if I actually open that door up and have a look, and then I'll probably change what I do. So, that's why Maya was born. Um, fundamentally, that was why Maya Grazing was, was born, because of stress. And, and wanting to avoid pain. And, uh, and Alistair and his team were, you know, um, 
committed enough to actually open that door, not knowing how many thousands of hours it was going to take. And uh, so I'll, I'll encapsulate the reason for that. And again, apologies, Alistair, but I'm going to put up Woodburn here. Because I think it's fair, right? We're, we're all adults. We're all in the room. We all care about the same things. Um, this is the rolling rainfall for Woodburn. Through this period of time where we were having some tough love, some tough lessons, it was a gut buster. It was El Nino. I had a flood through my house in Moree, a, foot, uh, a metre and a half deep. Uh, things were pretty rosy. Um, the team didn't actually know how this farm ran because there was no data. It was just a bit of a, you know, best possible due diligence. How does this farm run? Well, well, let's build the numbers. From that day, it basically just fell off a cliff. Had to work out how does this farm work? What is the mental model for this farm? And blow me down if, the, if it actually bottomed out some two years later, 24 months later, down here with a cruncher of a drought, 490 mils for the rolling 12-month period. And that was stressful. Cost a fair bit of money to keep some very, very good genetics, 1800 bucks a head. Uh, a lot of time and energy put into those animals. Keeping them alive was priority number one. There wasn't enough data to, to, to go anywhere else to think about anything else. And hope and hope to get out of it. And uh, in the end, those animals um, had the ignominy of having their heads cut off for 400 bucks a head with a six-week wait. All right? And we've all been there in different forms or other. Right? There's, no, there's nowhere to, to hide there. It's, it's about what you learn from that. So this business learned from that. And wouldn't you know it, um, we didn't get the La Nina. We had another dry time in uh, 2016. Pretty much the same kind of, actually worse, kind of um, drop away in rainfall on this particular farm, right? Walker, New England, all sort of vague differentials, differences, but essentially the same Bronco ride as most of the Eastern Seaboard has experienced. Point being, three dry times. Next point being, did we learn? Or are we just going to keep going through it? So three dry times. Um, these numbers won't mean anything to some of you. It doesn't matter right now. Those three dry times, if we go and measure the feed consumed per 100 mils per hectare for a period of time up to each of those points, which will come out in the wash, we have these blips in stress, as David said earlier on, and Stu. The green line is what we've got in terms of our consumed grass per 100 mils of rain. The black line is what it should have been. That was the, that first dry time after the, El, the La Nina, first dry, first. El Nino after purchasing the property, and uh, I don't mind saying that was very stressful. Um, people working seven days a week to keep animals alive, it's, it's not much fun. I didn't have to do that. I, I was a consultant. I was paid to avoid that. Look what happened. <laughs> what actually happened was that we decided that it's not right, that, um, that the data couldn't have been seen by everybody at the right time to actually make decisions on time and actually get all the stuff that we've been talking about, which is why Maya was born. Um, I'll put this one last way, just because this is salient to people. I've just taken those same, num same numbers, converted those bounces in consumed grass per 100 mils, i.e. the dry times, into the difference between where, they, where we were and where we should have been. You know, 61% overstocked in that first blip, 38% overstocked in that second blip. Uh, as of last spring, 35% overstocked, or last winter, sorry. And as of now, basically, give or take 10%, we're on the money. There's no stress there. Absolutely, categorically, a pleasurable place to spend time talking with management because the angst is gone. So I put that up because it's tangible and it's, it's about people and it's about the relationship to numbers. And the fact is, um, we've, some of us have got kids and if, if we can't learn from our mistakes, uh, you, you make, make sure, you, you've got to wonder where we're going, right? So learning from mistakes is critical, we can. So what does Maya do? I've got no idea how my timing is going, so I'm just going to keep powering on here. So Maya does the operational... Uh, we all do the operational stuff. You all do it. There's all this stuff. Let's, let's not get bogged in it, right? There's maps and there's stock flows and trading accounts in terms of production and whatnots and stuff that's being put on animals, that, all the indirect costs and so on and so on. <coughs> Numbers, rainfall, who's eating what and when, what, is, what are the yields per paddock, on and on and on. Now... I'm not rushing, but I'm just going to scoot through this a little bit. <laughs> the, the point is, you all have a lot of day-to-day -day stuff. 
And you're all pretty good at the day-to-day -day stuff because it keeps you busy. And the day-to-day -day stuff is events. I'm moving the animals, I'm giving them a treatment, I'm weighing them, it rained, it didn't rain, whatever. We buy, we sell, we wean, we do. The event stuff, it's done, it's locked in, right? We're all doing it. It's generating data, though. In, ev in, in the average farm, it's, it's thousands of data points all the time. It's, it blows my mind how much data you guys accrue. That's fine, that's good. That's not what Myra's about. What Myra is about is the month-to-month -month helping you do the thing you would rather gouge your eyes out than do. Planning. Right, who likes to do planning? Nobody in the history of the earth, except for Craig Carter, <laughs> has, has ever said that I want to go and spend half a day in the office and plan. But you do want to avoid the pain that comes from not planning. And so that's what Myra's about. The month to month, the analytics and the planning, which comes to the decisions, which is what we're talking about. So in terms of the visual representation of that, it was mentioned earlier on, the grazing chart. It's the, it's the, it's the temporal and spatial representation of, that just means time and space, where the animals are, who's in the mob, how long they're there for. And, you know, again, most people, I have come to learn, are really good at the past. Yep, let's keep that up to date, that's sound, that's, that's sexy, I've got a bit of a painting coming along here, it's helping me understand how much I'm taking out of my paddocks by moving animals around or not, for argument's sake. Um, but what most people are not good at is actually stopping to think about the future, because you're busy. We're doing all that uh, activity stuff. So what, what fundamental, I mean, this is just a grazing chart, right? Um, it's just a digital form of it. And you know, we've just taken the time to say, righto, if you set stock, you set stock, you're still harvesting grass. If you move them around every other day or every day or a few times a day, you're harvesting grass, we want to know how much and do the maths for it. If you open a few gates, whoops, if you open a few gates, because that's what you've got to do, drift grazing the calves and doing all the stuff that crazy guys do, then the maths has to work out. Or you might have multiple mobs per paddock. It's all got to work out and the maths of it's in there, which again, you can do on a paper chart. People do. It's just a lot more work. So... Uh, it's about the maths, because this is the stuff you don't hold around in your head. How much is that, how much is that mob taken out of that paddock since we first put them in there, and how many sheep equivalents or um, large stock unit equivalents or whatever are in there? And then, you know, we dive into the details. So this is a many-to-many -many relationship that basically blows up Excels. That's why we built this thing. We blew up a bunch of Excels. We, bunch, we, blew, we blew up some computers. And that's why we then went to Peter's crew, who is now our crew, and said, right, let's build this puppy, because we're over it. We need some tools that actually do this for us. So our reason for being is not actually the data. The data is essential, but our reason for being is the analytics and the decisions that come from that. And again, it's back to the what is it, what should it be, and what will it be? And you'd be amazed at how much your farm, your paddocks, your animals, and your people for that matter, can tell you about where it is right now, and then we can start to dive into what it should be, based on what it's told us about its own history in the past, and maybe we've got to extrapolate at times when we haven't got that history, but our own country is the best teacher of how it has performed. And what it will be just means, let's cast that forward. Computers are really good at saying, I don't care what, what's yesterday versus today versus tomorrow, it's just a number, it's just a, it's a perspective. So it's actually really easy to roll things forward and roll things back and say, what could have been? And then decisions, it's all about the forecasting and the, the planning, the bit that well, we kind of hate, but we do it to avoid pain. So the goal of the analytics, I'll just, just scoot this through because this is, um, this is where the sex is for me, right? <laughs> um, that's been a long few days. So the, the, goal, <laughs> the goal is, I, I spend a lot of my time mapping cropping, dry land cropping, um, and that is an, in, an insane lifestyle to, to, to achieve. <laughs> Grass is predictable. Not growing it, but the consumption of it and the conversion of it is a far more ma mathematically predictable set of rolling numbers than it is to go and harvest um, dry land wheat at Moree, is my lesson in life. And I think all of this is teaching us. As a team, we are learning that uh, we're taking... We, our opportunity here is to take grazing into the same sort of mind frame and learn from our paddocks and parts of our paddocks and parts of our, all of our animals in different ways so that we can get a, a map of production. And not just a map of production like, you know, here's kilos of grass, it could have been animal days, it could have been stock days, it could have been DSE days, it could have been whatever you want, whatever language you're talking in. In this case, it's just dry matter. This is actually the paddocks you're going to be looking at over at lunchtime. 
Yeah? We've, we've always got to spread in production and we always forget about it. But then the sexy bit is, you know what, we've got a relationship between each of those things and the animals that grazed it and the last time it rained versus the last time it should have rained versus the last time it usually, what, the, the last time we harvested grass from this thing when we used to do this last year or the year before or the year before when the season was early or the season was late. So all of a sudden these numbers that kind of fry your brain when using Excels can come through. And we come up with a bunch of metrics. I won't get bogged on them, but basically this is our way of saying, how is it? Right? Alastair looks in and says, how are things going? <laughs> and we now have people in, in Texas and Canada and South America and New Zealand saying, how are things going? And, and we had to be bilingual so that that all flows through. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it's just numbers, right? It's how you interpret those numbers that then becomes the hard part, which is why we've got people like RCS and, and Brian Marshall and the HM crew that I can see here to help people get that level of um, basic understanding that isn't frightening about what is an animal unit? What is a stock unit? What is a dry sheep equivalent unit? What's a dry amount of kilo, what kilo of grass look like out in the paddock instead of it being this thing that I went to a field day once and I've got no idea what that bloke's talking about, right? These are the things that we can learn from our own numbers. Um, I promise you, you can our best teacher is our own numbers. So, uh, the metrics that matter. Grass consumed per actual rainfall. Right? D Thank you for that. Dumb it down. There's all sorts of ways of describing it in terms of how you think about your grass, whether it's dry matter, pounds per acre, dry sheep, large stock units, whatever. It's the consumption of grass per hectare per 100 mils of rain that is telling us whether we're at, at, close to where we should be, which is carrying capacity. For a paddock, a group of paddocks, a property, a district for that matter. Or for a soil type, for a volcano like over there, the alluvial black soil over there, the granite that's down the road. That matters, right? And our own numbers can tell us that. So, again, fur, seed, inputs, people. How is our production relative to those things? All of these numbers are flowing through your farms. But then it's, it's actually a matter of how we harvest that and learn from it to actually make better decisions. And so that's where we start. And then we get these, these, these things because we've learned that um, um, decimal points and, and fancy numbers scare people. So red is bad, blue is good. Enough said. You are driving home on Friday night. You've had two beers. Follow the dashed line, the white line in the middle of the road. Based on your stocking rate, based on the actual rain that these paddocks have had and what we have learned that their carrying capacity is, follow the white line on the Friday night. Don't have any more beers. And this, this is, I think, as David said, this is the task. We are never at utopia. We are never perfect. What separates everyone in this room is how well they will finesse that. We are all affected by drought. We are all affected by everything. What matters is how we, how we respond to that, how we refine that, and how we make a margin from that to then have choices. So uh, I'm pretty close to wrapping up here. In terms of um, what that means, because the metrics are great. They're, they're very sexy. But what really is um, valuable is to say, let's turn a problem, because plenty of us in the room have a problem. We're either... Um, a little bit overstocked or a lot overstocked. That's a pretty, you know, we've, we've already talked about it, right? It's not a good place to be. You get stuck there, and there being today, being the difference between white and whatever that colour is, that's a bad place to be. As soon as we take that to a plan and say, I'm gonna, I've got a way of forecasting my assumptions about the season and my numbers, weaning early, finding adjustment, selling some, finding another farm, whatever, that is now a plan. And I, I'm, I can live with the plan. The bank manager can live with the plan. The wife can live with the plan. Without the plan, we're in a world of pain. To actually achieve that, uh, I, I won't... Uh, we can get people to show you how to do that. But to actually achieve that, Dave McLean, the HM guys, they do it in their sleep, day in, day out. It's actually about taking stock of our numbers and then just forecasting forward. Same goes on the understock side. There's just as much opportunity cost on the understock side as there is on the, on the, on the overstock side. It's just that we don't tend to... Think of it that way. And if I just come down to the graze planning, right? So, uh, and I will say also that, um, that forecasting is not painful. You know, plenty of people 
in this room, but well, a few people in this room, and certainly plenty of people in my grazing, use forecasting to run their budgets for the property so that they, as David alluded to, they don't prepare for long-term average rainfall. They prepare for 70, 75, maybe 80%, maybe less, to, to get the budget to work. It's a good season, we're in the, we're, in the, we're in the money, we're in the clover. If it's an average season, we've budgeted for it. And this is how these tools would get used. The, the planning one, I'll just quickly talk about that because I reckon everyone, every, every field day I go to, it kind of pops up. Yeah, graze planning or um, feed budgeting, yeah, done that. Went to a grow praise, something or other, once upon a time. I kind of get that, but you know, I went home and I don't know what they were talking about. I really don't know what he's talking about. This is bread and butter forcing ourselves to consider when we're in a, a four-man team on the side of a mountain in the Himalayas. No, we're not. We're in, um, we're in, uh, we're in the back of nowhere. We've got a, a cupboard full of food, tins of this, tins of that. We know that we're not going to get any more food until spring. There's a diabetic. There's some fat ones. There's some skinny ones. All I'm saying is let's just sit and think about how we would deal with that. How would we deal with that? Well, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't just keep eating until I got hungry. Right? I would actually go to the cupboard. I would work out how much feed I've got. Right? I would work it out. I'd have to. I may not be good at it. I may not be proud of it. When I go to a field day and say, look, uh, yeah, maybe, I'd work it out. And then, if I haven't got enough, what am I going to do? I'm going to find another hut. I'm going to kill someone. I'm going, to, I'm going to change the way I, just, I make decisions, but I'm going to do something, right? I'm not going to just keep on motoring along, getting fat while I can, while they die. So that's what graze planning is, in a nutshell. Now, I've bastardised it, and Brian's going to bash me later on because that's not how you describe graze planning. But essentially, that's what it is. You know, that it is as simple as that mindset. And, and what we find with my grazing is that we've got a bunch of people in different continents doing this now, but a lot of people don't because we're busy. And uh, maybe we haven't had enough pain. So um, we've talked about that, turning a problem into a, into a plan. And I'll finish here. Um, this is my second last slide. We, we actually now have some data. So some of you are in that data. This is a, this is a way of saying, let's aggregate up the data um, and say, where are farms relative to their carrying capacity at a point in time? I just had to look at it and I did that. <laughs> I dream of Jeannie. So, so, I bet you couldn't do that. So, the, the, the variance between that squiggly line and the flat line is where we are off the money. The green line is the people that plan. They use a graze plan. They use a forecast tool in whatever format, but in my grazing we know because they're actually using it, right? The grey line is people who move mobs around, put rainfall in, put drenches in, do this and do that, but don't plan, i.e. they don't stop at um, the past and say, look, let's, let's, let's do that inventory of the cupboard. Work out how to do it and do it. And you'll notice that there's a bit of a difference there. The difference between those two lines is commonly called stress. Um, I just put this in to make myself feel better and because if I don't, Peter will um, ring my ears later. We're very proud of this. This is, this is actually telling us that people learn. This is actually saying stocking rate to carrying capacity over time using a tool and like my grazing, but actually in this case, actually my grazing. People actually get confronted with these numbers, okay, how are my paddocks, my land, my property, etc. Performing all the things we've just been talking about and blow me down if people don't learn. That's, that to me is sex on a stick. Okay, so the alternative movie, and this is my last slide. We've been through that. We've talked about that. There is, a, there is an alternative. Metrics, numbers, the things that, you know, you get a bit browned off about at times, but the decisions come from the metrics. You can't make the decisions without the metrics. You can't take the actions without the decisions, and without those three, you've got no choices. And the man and woman with choices wins the race when it comes to grass. And I think Stu opened up with that this morning. Uh, that's it. I'm happy to be here.